When you think of grunge music, it's hard not to conjure up images of Kurt and Courtney, Chris Cornell humming the chorus of Black Hole Sun, and Pearl Jam's gothic video for Jeremy. However, it was Andrew Wood who helped pave the way for these artists. With his bravely flamboyant onstage persona and theatrical rock anthems giving his peers the faith that grunge could become bigger than Seattle. Wood's story is marked with tragedy, with his band Mother Love Bone's hopes for major label success derailed by their lead singer's shock death at 24. The remaining members would go on to form a band called Pearl Jam, arguably the biggest rock band of the 1990s, while Wood's name would become synonymous with the phrase, what if. The crippling grasp opioids had on Seattle reached out to Wood, and it proved to be too much. Andrew was a moment in time for a brief period of time. On this episode, we'll look at what happens when drugs take control over your career and life, and how they can burn out such a bright star. That's my job, kind of in the band. Sad. Lonely. Sad. Make the girls weep. I like to make the girls weep, and guys for that matter too. Scott Weiland, one of rock's most distinctive voices, has died. Shadow Moon was found dead in the band's tour bus in New Orleans on Saturday afternoon. Mark Lanigan has died at the age of 57. Andrew Wood was pronounced dead from complications resulting from a drug overdose. Wayne Staley was found dead in his Seattle home on Friday. On March 16, 1990, flamboyant frontman for Mother Love Bone, Andrew Wood, was found in the comatose state by his girlfriend, having overdosed on heroin. Wood was taken to Harvardview Hospital and placed on life support. Physicians suggested that Wood be removed from life support, and he was pronounced dead at 3.15 p.m. on March 19, 1990. Thirty-three years later, there's still questions without answers as to what happened to Seattle's brightest up-and-coming star. It's early spring 1990, and Seattle's Paramount Theater is packed to the rafters, a fact that would have put a huge smile on the face of the man whose name is the marquee outside. But that man, Leandre the Love Child, also known as Andrew Wood, is dead. This is his memorial, and the rock scene percolating in America's Pacific Northwest will never be the same again. The funeral was very surreal, remembered Wood's best friend and flatmate Chris Cornell of Soundgarden. I was happy for him because it was packed, and they were showing films of him performing. He was a fucking rock star the day he was born. It didn't matter if he'd ever sold a single record. He was the only rock star I ever met. Wood was born in 1966, the youngest of a troubled family whose internal eruptions he tried to soothe from childhood with his larger-than-life personality and love for entertaining. As a kid, Wood was equally besotted with Elton John and Kiss. Later, he'd adopt an onstage persona it was all glittery top hats, white face makeup, and silk and satin costumes. He was 14 when he formed his first band, Malfunction, with older brother Kevin. The pair stayed home Easter Sunday in 1980 when the rest of the family decamped to his grandmother's, and by the time their folks had returned, they'd cooked up their first demo tape. By the mid-80s, Malfunction were fusing punk and metal with precautious suavity, unafraid to drop ludicrous guitar solos among the punk riffage. Wood, meanwhile, gave all his wild frontman ambitions, Light, equal parts Mark Bolin, Freddie Mercury, Prince, and Gene Simmons. He renamed himself Leandre the Love Child, inspired by an episode of the original 60s Star Trek TV series. Brother Kevin would become Kevin Stein, while drummer Regan Hagar became Thunder. When Andrew Wood performed at the club in Seattle in the 1980s, it was something you didn't forget in a hurry. With his face clad in clown makeup and lipstick, Wood wearing one of his mother's pink dresses, would whip his thick blonde locks back and forth as he sung pitch-perfect glam grunge melodies. Taking on the persona of Landry the Love Child, Wood along with his band Malfunction lit up the Seattle scene with distorted guitars and theatrical rock anthems, making small basement clubs feel like vast stadiums. For locals, it wasn't a question of if, but only when Wood would achieve national stardom. They were one of the wildest bands I ever saw and had something really mysterious going on. I'd say it was almost voodoo, recalls Seattle-based producer Chris Hanzek, who gave Malfunction their big break on the Deep Six album, a 1986 compilation of the area's best bands, including Melvin's, Green River, and Soundgarden. 
Andrew stuck me as somebody looking for something rare. He was a real treasure seeker. When we were recording Deep Six and setting up for vocals, I noticed he had brought along three pairs of outlandish sunglasses and a few costumes as well. I said to him, we're only recording vocals, there isn't an audience here. And he shrugged his shoulders and said to me, I need to get into character. It was like watching a method actor. Malfunctions soon found themselves a part of the vibrant local music scene operating within Seattle's network of underground clubs. The group's progress momentarily suppressed when Wood's heroin habit sent him to rehab in 1985. He confessed in therapy that his second girlfriend had introduced him to STDs and shooting drugs. Upon his return, Malfunction appeared on Deep Six, a compilation album that also featured friends like Soundgarden, Melvins, and Green River. But Wood's larger-than-life stage presence set Malfunction apart from their contemporaries. He craved playing stadiums, quipping that he'd even support Warrant to make that dream come true, and performed as if the shabby backrooms that were Malfunction's stomping grounds were in fact Madison Square Garden. I saw them in Olympia and I fell asleep in my chair, Nirvana frontman and upcoming grunge icon Kurt Cobain remembered. Andrew sang to me all night and danced around me and made fun of me. I felt like a heel when I woke up. Malfunction quietly imploded as Wood's attentions turned to his new group, Mother Love Bone. Formed in 1987 in the wake of Green River's split, future Mudhoney singer Mark Arm had begun to find his bandmates' ambitiousness laughable. Mother Love Bone paired Wood with guitarist Stone Gossard and bassist Jeff Ament. Their love rock perhaps owed more to glam rock and Guns N' Roses rather than the sludgy local grunge scene, but it was the perfect vehicle for Wood's voluminous star power, and in 1989, their shiny P became the very first major release by a quote, grunge act. Wood had drug and alcohol problems for years, in a handwritten piece of paper dated from 1989 that Wood called a drugalogue outline, which his family shared with filmmaker Scott Barber for the documentary Malfunction, The Andrew Wood Story, he chronicled his nearly lifelong progression through drugs and alcohol. He'd been just 12 when he started drinking and smoking marijuana. At 15, he graduated to acid and mushrooms. By his early 20s, he was a semi-regular user of heroin. He moved to Seattle, moving back in with his father after getting hepatitis from dirty needles. According to Seattle Times, his body turned yellow and his liver was shot. During a December 1986 interview with The Rocket, Wood said he and his malfunction bandmates had quit drugs a few months ago, and specifically stressed to the interviewer that it was okay to print that. Their song With Your Heart is about heroin and hepatitis. Friends staged an intervention around Thanksgiving of 1989 after which Wood checked himself into Valley General Hospital in Monroe, Washington. It is likely during this treatment that Wood prepared his drug log. The final entry in the document reads, 1990, one of two roads. While there, he told his fiance, Zana Lafuente, that if he ever had to make a choice between his music career or his sobriety, he'd choose the latter. Quote, he was coming home, crying, crying, crying. Please help me stop, I'm going to die, she told Barber. I'd tell the rest to Mother Love Bone, we need to talk about this. All they wanted to know about was the record deal. It was like the Twilight Zone. They didn't want to hear about it. Mother Love Bone played a show at the Central Tavern in Seattle on March 9th, 1990. This was Andrew Wood's final public performance. He had been out of rehab, was allegedly drug-free for 100 to 116 days, and had been working with a therapist and attending AA and NA meetings. On March 15th, 1990, a few days before the scheduled release of Mother Love Bone's album, Andrew Wood's brother Kevin had a permission that Andrew had relapsed. He called Andrew out on it, a charge he would deny. It's unclear where Seattle's problem with heroin started, but by the late 1990s, the smack had arrived in the Pacific Northwest. What is not disputed is the drug's persuasive presence. The Drug Abuse Warning Network has been charting the national heroin rise for years. There's a 34% increase in heroin from 1986 to 1994. Heroin fatalities increased nearly 300%. 
Heroin had always been Seattle's dark little secret, and it's a shameful secret. But the new generation of junkies who've moved to the city are not ashamed of it at all. They're not visible in public. It's a badge of honor. In Seattle, if you know your way around heroin, it's like takeout food. You can have your dope delivered. Even in early 2023, when I personally visited Seattle, there was more than one person openly shooting up heroin in the street. The next day, Wood was supposed to meet with Jeff Amen to work out of the gym. The next day, he was supposed to meet with Jeff Amen to work out of the gym. Wood had been on a program to get in shape for his live performances. Wood called Amen telling him he wasn't feeling good. His voice was kind of scratchy, Amen wrote. Looking back on it, he was high, but at the time I didn't notice that. He sounded sick. No big deal. Wood was supposed to meet with his tour chaperone that night, whose job was to ensure that he stayed sober. Andrew called Kelly Curtis and told him he wouldn't be able to make it to practice and that his fiance was going to think he had done drugs. Did you? Curtis asked. No, Wood responded. Also on that same day, Mike Starr said he ran into Wood in Kelly Curtis's basement. Wood asked him for a ride home. Mike passed it by about three blocks, after which Wood got out. When he did, Mike said he, quote, went up to this Mexican guy when he got out. David Duet saw Wood copying drugs at the Denny Street House, which, as he told Mark Arm, was inhabited by a bunch of crazy kids. There was a drug dealer that lived there. I used to spend the night over there sometimes. I would wake up and there would be a cast of characters there. Multiple people moved in and out of that place. They had parties and bands played in the basement, David added. I saw him that day. It was devastating. Because one of those people you did not expect. La Fuente was at work meeting that night and left at 10 instead of her usual 6.30 or 7 time. Two co-workers asked for a ride home, which she agreed to, but it added another 30 to 40 minutes to her trip home. When she got there, Wood was laying face down, unconscious, on the bed. According to the Seattle Times, who attributed this information to Wood's father, who had heard it from La Fuente, Wood's arms were sprawled out on his side and his face was tinged blue. There was a needle puncture in his arm, with a syringe found nearby. LaFuente called 911 at 10.10 p.m., and the dispatcher told her how to administrate CPR while paramedics arrived. Although initially presumed dead at 10.34 p.m., Wood was revived and placed on a respirator. He was admitted to intensive care at Harborview Medical Center in Seattle at 12.40 a.m. He initially showed signs of improvement, but a CT scan showed brain swelling. LaFuente called several people with the bad news. Probably too many people. I wish I would have never called anyone and told them he was there, LaFuente told Mark Yarm. Because of that scene there, a lot of people didn't deserve to be part of that. There were a lot of groupies showing up. Alice and Chains arrived at Harborview Medical Center after hearing the news. Jerry Cantrell, among others, were upset that a man fighting for his life was being turned into a gathering and nearly got into a fight. Soundgarden were playing in Brooklyn at the time, and after the show, were informed of Andrew's health. The next night, Chris Cornell and Susan Silver flew to Seattle to see Wood. After everyone arrived, they were informed that life support was going to be turned off. By Monday, Wood was brain dead, and any sign of improvement was long gone. Wood's parents decided to remove him from life support, but LaFuente would not let them until Cornell arrived. According to LaFuente, his whole family was at the hospital, like 20 people. They all went in and saw him. All of his friends went in and saw him. Then I went in, had cut his hair off and kept it. I played some Queen for him. They were his favorite band. The doctors turned everything off, and I just held him really tight, listened to his heart until it stopped. It took like 15 minutes. He was 24 years old. A coroner concluded he died of lack of oxygen to the brain as a result of his overdose. A public memorial service was held at the Paramount Theater on March 24th. Ken Deans and LaFuente spoke. There was a video tribute put together by friends. David Wood, Andrew's father, addressed the audience by saying, My son was a junkie. He urged the crowd not to do drugs. He addressed the surviving members of Mother Lovebone. I want you guys to go on and be the biggest stars you could be. I want to see you guys on TV. If you have to get another singer, don't get a junkie. Chris Cornell remembered being in the crowded living room for the wake, with LaFuente telling everybody, this is just like La Bamba, the 1987 Richie Valens biopic. At that moment, he heard slapping footsteps growing louder and louder as they reached the front door, and Lane flew in, completely breaking down and crying so deeply that he looked truly frightened and lost. Very childlike, Cornell added. I wanted to just run up to him and give him a big hug. I wanted to be that person for Lane. 
Maybe just because he needed it so bad. I wasn't. I didn't get up in front of everyone and offer that, and I still regret it. No one else did either, and I don't know why. Mike Starr then walked in and said, he wants to smoke a joint. He immediately regretted the insensitive nature of his comment when he saw Cornell in tears looking at a photo album of wood. Alice in Chains released a song in 1992 titled Wood, which was written about Andrew Wood's struggles and his untimely passing. Ament and Gossard were devastated by the death of Wood and the resulting demise of Mother Lovebone. Shortly after Wood's tragic passing, the group recruited a young up-and-coming singer named Eddie Vedder to sing for the band. This group would go on to be Pearl Jam. 33 years later, the death of Andrew Wood remains as tragic as it was in 1990. The bright star that was Andrew burned out right when he was entering his prime. As of today, we could have seen Mother Lovebone receive the success and respect that bands like Pearl Jam and Alice in Chains have. Wood was passionate about his music and had all the makings to become the biggest superstar in the Seattle sound.